All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been told it sounds like I'm crunching on celery. I apologize for that. I'm not going to be speaking much. Um, my name is Paris Alston. I'm going to moderate today's session for you. Um, as a reminder, please go ahead and open up Slido now. So you can use that on your phones or on um, your computer. Go to slido.com, enter the event code identity equity 11. We're going to be using Slido for both questions and for polling, so it's really important to have that open. Um, so I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Um, Nakasha Perkins is a Wisconsin native, and she is our new assistant director for social equity. She has 20 um, years of experience working in nonprofit, social enterprise, and corporate environments. Um, Nakasha promotes confidence in identity and offers tools to, to navigate the trauma of racial, economic, accessibility, and health inequities that show up in the places we live, work, and play. And we're very happy to have Nopatris here at ODOT. She's going to be identifying and addressing systemic barriers to ensure all Oregonians benefit from transportation services and investments. So um, we are going to be starting um, with the reactions and responses to the social identity wheel. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Nopatris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to do a, a quick check. I can see a couple of faces. If you just nod, if you can hear me well, we're good. Awesome. So I got a few nods. So we're going to keep going. So good morning. I'm really excited to go through um, this uh, exercise and training today. And we're going to start right away with you. So I hope you've been able to log into Slido um, because the first thing we're going to do is talk about your reactions to the pre-work. So in talking about social identity, the first thing that we really want to think about is our own identity, because it allows us to understand, empathize, sympathize other people's experience and their identity. So you got an email, had some pre-work on it for you to think about your own social identity and, you know, the ones you think about the most often, which identities you identify as. You can go to the next slide. The question that we're going to be asking once you report to on Slido is how are you challenged or surprised by your social identity reflection. So when you thought about, you know, maybe your ethnicity or gender or class or religion and how often you think about that or how often it comes up for you, how are you challenged or surprised by your own social identity reflection? If you can go ahead and put that in Slido, it will get us moving. So I see I had to really think about which of these identities I think about the most. It was a bit challenging. The difference between how I critique myself versus how I think others critique me. Uh, the depth to which I took all of this for granted. Identity reflection changes over time. I never really thought about my class. I think about my gender first. So these are great. Surprised by the reflection of how some identities have changed as I have become an adult i.e. class shifting from childhood to, to adulthood. I want to stop right there for a second. That one is a really big one in terms of thinking about social identity. Oftentimes when I've done like very specific workshops about class identity, there's a distinction between sometimes how we were raised and how we currently live. Some people who were raised in um, working class or maybe even raised in poverty, that continues no matter what their class becomes. And so some of that identity and some of the habits or some of the trauma that they've experienced you could become the top 1% in the nation and still have some of that with you. And it's still how you might necessarily identify. So even if some of our identities actually identify how we're raised and the identities that we were when we were 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, 11 to 24, when some of those things really submit, have a, submit, have a really big um, in, impact on us. I think my reflections uh, were about what I thought. Yeah. What caught my attention is when I think of myself, I'm focused on my current life state and transitions and ability versus more traditionally continuous states like gender and age, which is interesting um, when you think about the life state and transitions and ability. Of a, an ability. So like for some, ability transitions over time, right? 
And also for some, that happens for gender and age as well. And so that's another thing about identity and having to be and being able to really reflect on our own identity and how we're able to show up in the world. How the focus has shifted as I've aged. Some are easy, straightforward. Others are more complex as far as how I want to box myself. Um, I may, it made me pause quite a bit to really think about how I think people box me. That is a beautiful place to keep going. All right, so the goal of this was really just to have people think about their own identity um, and how they do, quote unquote, box themselves or how others perceive you, right? Because a lot of these identities, we are not outwardly talking about every single day. People aren't walking around going, hey, just wanted to let you know, based on my last pay stub, this is my socioeconomic status. That's usually not happening. However, there are pe assumptions people are making based on how you dress, what you eat, what you're doing, what you say, how you speak. Um, and so it is important to think about um, or helpful to think about how you identify and how others may be identifying you. My faith drives my beliefs, and social identity is always adapting. This is awesome. Uh, if you could go to the next slide for me, I want to just talk about what we are going to do, hopefully, in this time together today. I'm going to be very honest. It is going to move a little bit rapidly, which is why I gave you all the materials, right? So the goal here is to touch the top and kind of get a very basic foundational dive <laughs> in hopes that we can continue to dive into these things. I think that we'll be talking about, I hope we'll be talking about social identity as an agency um, pretty significantly as we move forward, thinking about how we're the Office of Social Equity. So when we're talking about equity, this is really what it's grounded in. So, but from this session, I hope that you'll be able to define social identity versus personal identity. I hope you'll be able to talk about your privilege, um, describe the cycle of socialization, and identify some ways to implement the reflections you might have had during this time or in the pre-work almost immediately. So if you go to the next slide, we'll start with just simply what it means to think about the big eight identities. So we're using the big eight plus one. Sometimes if you just Google big eight identities, for the most part, you will see the identities that are in the earth tone colors, right? You might not see age, which is why we have a plus one. And sometimes you'll also see um, English language first or first language being English as one of the big eight. So these are the big eight that we're thinking about. These are social identities and not personal identities, because social identities are really connected to how systems are created. They're, cre they're think about how we design spaces, how we move throughout the world. Our personal identities, were, which are also very important, like I'm a sister, I'm a, um, I'm trying to think of things I actually am, but I'm not going to do that. I could be a cyclist, which I'm not. I mean, I have a bike, but I'm not a cyclist, right? Um, I am a bird watcher. I am a reader. Like those are all personal identities that do connect me to other people and also will connect you to other people. And those personal identities are very important. They often though do not show up in spaces that create systems, right? Like I so I am a reader. I'm an avid reader. I read about a book a week. That me reading has never created a space where it's like I'm able to move into spaces being a reader, or people are deciding I can get a job or can't get a job because I'm a reader, or I have access to things or don't have access to things because I'm a reader. So though those personal identities are important, I, have a, I like book clubs, I connect with people around reading, I have friends because we were talking about the same book in some random networking event and now we've stayed in contact, that happens, but systems aren't created around those. Systems are, have been created around our social identities. So ability, right? Like when you think about spaces, when you think about the office space that you traditionally work in at ODOT, whether that is a maintenance yard, whether that is an office with cubicles with high walls, short walls, low counters, high counters, think about the bathrooms in that space, think about how you enter that building. In many cases, buildings are built for able, people who are able-bodied, right, or temporarily able-bodied. Then we make the adjustment so that different, different abilities can enter and be a part of it. But what that means is that people, if I'm in a wheelchair, I can only go one way. If I'm on crutches, I can only go on one way. I can only get one way. I need to think about which bathroom I'm going to go to. I need to think about which side of a building I'm coming into, right, and how easy it is to navigate that or where I park or if I even can park in front of a building or if I need to walk further. And all of those things are a huge idea, a huge system, right? It doesn't mean that Nakatra's personally decided in terms of ability or in terms of space that that 
the system was created, but it is how we design and build things. And all of these are literally how some things have been designed and built. It doesn't mean, so ability is one that, you know, there's very clear, the American Disabilities Act, there's very clear specifications, and it is still very active right now. Some systems were built in 1872, and we are still living those systems, even though we don't necessarily actively think about them. Some of that might be around nationality and race, because there were systems built to ensure that in order for us to put a box and decide who moves where, that was one of the classifications that was used. Or class, if you have your owning class at one point, um, or were you working class, and those definitions and the words that we use have changed over time, but it's still kind of the same thing. People with more money have access to more things. People with wealth have access to more things. And those are not, like I could have $20, but I might not have $20 in the bank. There are some people who are not using cash flow immediately, but their assets are humongous. And what does it mean for them to have wealth or generations of wealth in a family that allow them to move throughout our country differently um, and have access to things in terms of um, ability to get places, ability to look for jobs or not need to work, ability to own instead of being someone who is dependent on how other people decide what is owned and how other things are shared. And, you know, I've just ask a uh, um, producer to get me the groceries I need maybe or the food that I need as opposed to there are people that based on class that get food based on what is available at the store nearest them, the end. And that is a class designation or system, right? So if I live in a food desert, that means that I'm usually going to stores that maybe aren't full line grocery stores. So the food that I have access to is based on that. Instead of I have a car, a plane, a helicopter, a boat, all the things necessary to get me to the grocery store that makes the most sense for me or to get the food that makes the most sense for me. So that's why we use these as social identities and that difference because systems are created around them. We've added age because age is a thing that, one, everybody has experienced that transition, right? At some point, you were a young person, and people told you, you cannot do the following things. You cannot vote. You cannot drive. You cannot touch that. You cannot ride that ride because you're two, uh, you, until you're three feet, right, or two feet. Like, there's just so many things you can't do based on growth and age because our society has created a system around when you're mature enough or smart enough or know enough or have enough experience based on how long you've been on the planet, then you have rights to do some of these things. And so it's something we all experience. Additionally, in terms of work, we think about people in the beginning of their career who often experience you don't know, you don't know how we do things, you don't understand how that happens, and therefore there's an experience there. And there's also an experience around people who know a whole lot and have been doing it for a long time, and it's like, we don't do it like that anymore, or we just want to have a conversation about when you're retiring. We are wondering, you know, how you're feeling and if that would be soon. And all those things are connected to age. And so these are the big eight plus one identities that we are going to use foundationally as an agency as we move forward. And we want people to reflect on them and think about them. Think about some of the decisions we make and think about some of the ways we move forward. If you go to the next slide, another way to think about this, and this is two more things that in terms of these very specific categories, um, is that the way these systems are created, they either oppress people, right, or there's privilege associated with it. So I know at, um, around the time I first started, a director Strickler sent a letter out talking about his own white male privilege. And um, there was some pushback from some people that was just like, I don't know what that means, or like, I'm a white man and I don't think I have any privilege. I've had to work very hard for things. So that is connected to the social identity. So oppression and privilege are really about what it in, about systems. It's not about individuals. You could have worked hard all your life, and at the same time, if you are an able-bodied, middle-aged, middle-class, English as first language, um, cisgender man who lives in the United States and who is white and Christian and heterosexual, and it's all the privileges, right? There are going to be things that you never had to consider or have never been a barrier to you. Now. What is very interesting about these identity categories and what's important to remember is that most of us, right, are cross-sectioning. So I am um, an able-bodied person who is technically middle-aged because at 24, you're no longer a young person. Sorry if you, this is the definition, it's not my fault. So technically middle-aged, um, middle class, speaks English as a first language, and I'm a woman, right? and I'm in with the United States, and I identify as black. 
and I don't identify as Christian. And so in those spaces, there is a lot of privilege that I have in some rooms because in some rooms, it doesn't, some of these things aren't matter. If I'm in a room full of, let's say, black women, right, my privileges, depending on the diversity of the black women there, it might be black women who are all living in, who are working class or who are poor, um, who are young, who are aging, who are LGBT, QIA, um, and because of that, my privileges put me in a position where I have more access in the room, most of the room that I'm in easily. So it's important to look at both sides. Another thing I want to point out about this very particularly is that you also will see this chart that instead of saying oppressed and privileged, it says target and agent. And so what that means is that there are people who are targeted by the oppression, and that's the oppressed column, and there are people who are agents of the oppression, and that's the privileged column. It says it that way because even if I am not um, deciding that um, I am, if I, even though I am not, I speak English, it's my first language, I do not know another language, right? That is a privilege. And in spaces, I'm an agent of oppression because I could be in a room where I'm almost demanding people speak English. My position demands that people speak English. They, it demands like how I do everything, right? Like I need you to speak English because I speak English. And because English has, especially in the United States, almost a demand on it. Like you don't, the amount of people who hear who don't speak English as a first language, why don't you know English? If you're going to be here, know English. You need to know English. And that is a requirement almost. It's a requirement of a system. Therefore, I'm an agent of oppression, not knowing other languages. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person. That doesn't mean that I should walk around feeling guilty. It means I need to be aware of that and think about how I can make space for people whose language, first language is not English. I saw that there was a question about, um, which we're actually gonna go to questions. So let me do that. You can go to the next slide uh, and I'll answer a question while some other things come in. So that, in my opinion, is a lot of information. In my experience, people see some of that stuff and they're like, not me, I didn't do this. Wait a minute, wait, hold on, am I supposed to be doing something different? And so what is a word or phrase that comes to mind after learning or being reminded of social identities and systemic oppression? Because I think that's helpful, right? I want you to know that all those feelings make sense and so I want us to be able to share them. So if we can add those to Slido, and while that's happening, I will start with um, cisgender. Some people, somebody asked what, a, what cisgender meant. Cisgender is single gender and the gender and um, your born biological sex matching your identity, right? So my I was born um, with the biological um, part of a female and I identify as a woman. Um, and I identify, some people identify as like they're non-binary. It's like I really don't identify as, as man or woman. I don't identify in those gender boxes. It's more of a, a spectrum for me. And so they wouldn't consider themselves cisgender. Um, but because I am singular, like I, I identify as woman, and that also matches people's, um, especially in the United States, right, understanding of um, female and woman having matching Matching is a really bad word. Parts, biologically, as well as um, uh, ex gender expression, those two things um, will make me cisgender. So things that came up, privilege can shift in different spaces. Yes, I'm mostly privileged. Understanding more boxes, opportunities, understanding. I'm sitting with the tension of holding identities that are both oppressed and agents of oppression. Questioning, insight, want to understand and be compassionate. Um, frustration, aware, default in social spaces, um, privilege equals responsibility, sharing privilege. Um, I want to just talk about default in social spaces. I think that is so powerful. Like, and I will also want to say that I think that is also something that in a lot of places feels kind of normal, and we're going to talk about that actually next. Sharing privilege. Um, there's things that are below that, but I don't know what it says. Um, so I just want to thank you. Intersectionality. Um, and so really quickly, intersectionality, I think oftentimes gets confused with intersecting um, identities. And so intersectionality is what happens when you are in that oppressed column and you have multiple oppressions coming towards you. You can still be experiencing intersecting identities, right? Like I can be a um, Christian man and I have intersecting identities, but that does not a experience of intersectionality because in both of those spaces I am I have privilege, right? So intersectionality 
which is a term coined by Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, is really about what it looks like when people have intersecting identities that are experienced in um, are experiencing systemic oppression. A lot of work to do, never ending, truth to power. I true, if we truly loved each other as people, we would be fine. Don't have to agree, just love other humans. Oh, you should look at the video. I, I don't know how to share it. So there's a video by Maya Angelou. It's um, called, so you can just Google it. It's on YouTube. It's only like three minutes long. Um, and it's, I think it's called like human. If you do Maya Angelou and human, it's going to come up. But it starts with a quote by the Greek philosopher Terence who says, I am a human being, and so nothing human can be alien to me. So oftentimes when we talk about humans, like we're all human, we just love each other for your human, but we also spend time as people um, kind of judging like other things, right? So if you are a murderer, I'm like, well, come on, that's wrong. But also, if you are a murderer, you're a human and I'm a human, so I have the capacity to murder just like you do. And so I have to figure that out and respect that and sit with that and not judge you in that space. And what does that do, right? So that is a really big one, thinking about being human and what it means to find that connection no matter what. Um, judgment and fragility. Uh, yes, all right. So I am going to, I'm charging myself mostly with continuing. So default is something I wanted to talk about. So if we go to the next slide, and I sent you um, a worksheet that was developed um, by – um, oh, developed in like 1997 as a part of teaching diversity and social justice. It's called the cycle of socialization. And so I sent it to you so that you could um, have your own copy. It looks a little bit different than the copy that you're seeing in front of you, but I promise it's the exact same thing. So the cycle of socialization really just helps us understand what someone uses in the term default, right? So we're born, right? We're born into a world with mechanics in place, there's no consciousness, there's no guilt, there's no choice, and also, <laughs> right, what also happens is we get misinformation and biases and stereotypes and prejudices and history and habit and tradition and things that we never consider to be places where there could even be any type of oppression or systemic oppression, right, it's systems. We don't even think about that. Like, there's information we get about who does things and who, don't, who doesn't do things. And so we're taught on a personal level by family members, by teachers, by people we love and trust um, that kind of shape our expectations and norms and values and roles and rules. And a lot of those things, I would even argue, this is my own personal argument, that a good one half to a three quarters of those things make, are fine and they're not creating boxes. But there are a number of those things that do create boxes for people and do um, then reinforce some of the oppression that people experience, or even that we've also experienced. So something else that we're not going to dive into because a whole other thing is internalized oppression. So I'll use um, women, for example, right? So one of the groups that experience um, systemic oppression, people who identify as women um, or who are identified as women, right? Like we talk about pay gaps, we talk about promotion, we talk about hiring. In that space, there's, there's also... I'm on hiring a, a woman who is hiring, I might have some of the same tendencies around the, how the system of sexism has been built, even if I'm looking at another woman, like, oh, she might not be able to lift it. She won't be able to do this. There's too much math. I don't think that she really needs that much pay for that. I'm sure she'll do it for less. Like, there's all of those things that could still happen, me being a woman and trying to hire another woman, because I've internalized some of that oppression for myself and have created a norm around that based on socialization. Okay, and so then what happens is, as we move into that pink box, so the beginning, I've put beginning and then first socialization. We're born, and then in that green, that is where our first socialization happens. People who are really close to us, who we love and trust, which is also why as we unlearn things, it's really hard to go back to that green box like, hey, did you know that some of these things you were saying aren't true? It's why when people are talking about, like, I want to figure out how to interrupt this, Sometimes it's like, well, talk to your uncle and your aunt and your grandfather and your sister about these things, right? Like that's some, some of the hardest conversations because you love and trust those people and some of those things they taught you. And so hitting up against that sometimes is the hardest conversation. As we continue through life, we, we meet inter institutional and cultural socialization where we get into a space where those same messages um, are reinforced 
And so we get them from institutions where it's like church or TV or legal systems. We get it from culture, lyrics, language, thoughts of patterns. And it's conscious and unconscious, right? So there's things that we don't even notice that we're learning but are being reinforced and things that we definitely notice that we're learning and being reinforced. And the result of that is that we have stigmatized spaces and people. We have privilege, we have oppression, there's discrimination, there's empowerment, there's rewards and punishment depending on the social identities, right? So that's how these things go together. In that those two pinks, pink to dark maroon, what's happening is we are officially cementing personally what our thoughts and patterns are around social identities. And we're deciding who gets a reward and who gets a punishment, who gets privileged and who's oppressed. Like we're deciding all of those things, some of them conscious and again, unconscious, and some of them also internalizing them against some of the identities that we actually share. And some of them are huge, right? And some of them aren't. And so I'll give one very quick example of how this can like snowball. So when I was in third grade, I transferred to a really awesome school in Milwaukee. And by awesome, I mean like top-notch quality. We got a scholarship. My entire family was excited that I was about to be able to go to like this school of all schools. And so I went there and I was coming from schools where, like most of us, most of our schools, especially from like K through five, most people look like us. Most of our friends look like us. Most of our family associations look like us. We live in a place where even if you have live in a diverse place, most of our friends and closest family and people we hang out with are homogenous groups. And we don't see that shift until we move middle school and then through work. That is where we usually meet diverse groups of people in schooling and in work, right? So K through three, I was in a school where most people looked like me. It was also attached to the church we went to. So I knew everybody's family. I knew we all were knew the same three hymnal songs. Like I was a church and attached to the school. Third grade, I switched to a school where no one in my class looked, looked like me. Um, and I went to that school for, for and, until ninth grade. So in that school, I'd say my class was a, probably a really small school, too, in terms of class sizes. So in my, in my third grade in those classrooms, there were probably about 50 of us. Of the 50 of us, three of us identified as non-white. So I remember in seventh grade, three black boys came, and it was like the most mind-blowing thing that ever happened because a black boy had never been in any of our classes. Um, and so in third grade, I was the only person that looked like me in my actual classroom, but there were three of us spread throughout the classroom. One day I passed gas. And I asked to go to the nurse. I asked to do so many things to try to get out of the classroom. Somehow, I can't tell you when, but I guarantee unconsciously through misinformation and first socialization and also not having any experience with other people, I knew that one, they were going to know that I was the person that passed gas. Um, because from my, I can, again, I can't tell you how, white people do not pass gas. So I was going to be the dirty black girl in the class now because I couldn't hold it. I was sick for the rest of the day. I didn't want to go back to school the next day. And I was trying to explain it to my mom, and she was like, I have absolutely no idea where you got this from. But it is the most vivid memory I have because I was so embarrassed. Nobody ever said it stinks. Nobody said anything to me. But my internalized, like, reaction to how much, like, trouble it was going to cause for me is mind-blowing to me at this point. And that is literally just unconscious socialization and what it means for me to decide that passing gas, which is a biological thing, would only happen from black people. And so then the white people would be like, oh, the dirty black girl. Why would they call me dirty? Like, I don't even know how I got that, right? And so that's what the cycle of socialization does. And what that results in as you move into the blue is it results in silence, anger, dehumanization, guilt, self-hatred, stress, violence, and crime. But there is an option for this cycle not to continue. Because when we learn these things, if I use age, theory says that somewhere around between 24 and 30, these are, it's over. Like, these are the things we know, right? But also in those ages, we could be unlearning things because you usually meet more people in that space as that is a time where you're, you're um, kind of going out on your own. So the chances of you meeting people in school, in bars, in all the other great places you go, in new work, you just meet more people that you wouldn't have necessarily met in your circles. So we can do nothing. And we don't, because we don't know to do anything, because it does, it makes, everything makes sense to us, and it, this cycle continues. We also could do something and raise consciousness or change or interrupt or educate and question and reframe so that this cycle of socialization doesn't continue. And that interruption is really hard. Um, so let us go to the next slide. 
So this is a lot of information. And I don't want you to take it and go, eh, that was a lot. So, all right, gonna keep reading. So what I want to challenge us is to, so what, now what? So, so what is all of these things are happening at ODOT because we are humans at ODOT who experience the cycle of socialization, who have social identities, and who are trying to figure all those things out, right? So that's why this matters. It matters because we are targets and agents, right? We are experiencing oppression and we are experiencing privilege. We are, because we're here, because we're alive, because we're present. That's why this matters at all. That's why we're talking about it. That's why the Office of Social Equity exists, because what would it look like to be in a space where people aren't experiencing that? And the only way to change that is for us to interrupt the cycle of socialization, which can happen at work. Now, I know some people are like, but you shouldn't do that at work. We should just like work and be quiet. That's fair. That is definitely a way that it has happened, but also that way continues the cycle of socialization. Um, we are not trying to move into an agency where it's like, now instead of designing and engineering and planning and managing and creating programs, we're just going to move to an organization that now does social equity. Not true. Also, we're in spaces and have conversations where a question or an interruption or a, I, I don't know if we should do it like that, or have we thought about this for people who would be impacted, or I've never thought about this, or who are we forgetting? Those types of questions could change drastically shift our agency into one who thinks about people in privilege and people who are being oppressed by systems and shift the system, right? And then ODOT becomes an agency that's like, nope, we are taking the entire system into consideration when we do this. So the now what is, in order to do that, we have to do it, like the 4,700 of us have to do it. So I'm going to switch you into um, breakout rooms. Um, how many people are Oh, that doesn't matter how many people are here. We could put on to great breakout rooms between like four and five people. So you're going to go into breakout room, and I want you to share with that group your now what, right? So you did the social identity wheel. You've seen the big eight plus one. You've seen the cycle of socialization. What is your now what? It is October 8th. If I came to each one of you on November 1st, like, all right, so what did you do with the information? What did you think about? What did you share? What, did you, what is your now what? How can you be an active member in trying to help us share this so we can interrupt the cycle of socialization? So they're going to split you into groups. You are going to be in groups for a whole seven minutes. So make it a good one. So four to five people split into groups of seven minutes. What is your now what? For the end of the month, what can you do to utilize this information? Your groups are coming. Are people being split into groups? Okay. It can be random. So, yes, um, the groups have been assigned. There's 13 different groups, I think, maybe a little bit more. They're just moving into those groups a little slowly. Like. So, what would you okay. like to say to them? It's going. There's just a lot of people. <laughs> no worries. So it's coming. There's a lot of people. We'll probably actually only give you five minutes, but you'll get a minute warning. So when your minute warning comes, warning comes and says you have 60 more seconds, don't press the button. Just know that you have 60 more seconds and then it'll pull you out of the group.
Tara said some people already been moved into a group. Yeah, there's 34 in this main session, so I'm not sure. And this is Emily. I keep getting kicked out of the meeting when the breakout rooms start and then the meeting starts back up for me. So I haven't actually been in a breakout room yet. Okay. That's Same with me and this is Christina. Well. Doing, yes. Yeah. Same okay. Here. So no worries, no worries. Just pull everybody back out of their groups. That's over. Fine. Just in the groups right now. It's over. We're going to do it all together in Slido. <laughs> Nakasha, do you want me to add a, a polling question to Slido? Do you want to do it that way? Um, yeah, so just now what would be the question? Nakatris, if you're doing this session again yes. next time, um, on the bottom where it says record share screen, there was an option with four boxes that said breakout room. And so it looked like we were mm -hmm. able to join ourselves by clicking on that. So for future reference, it looks like there was an option for the participants to get into the breakout room. Yeah, that's how they broke you out into rooms, but it looks like because of the amount of people, who knows, we're fine. Is, are everybody, is everybody back? <laughs> we're not gonna let technology stop us. We've got uh, about 10 seconds and then they're gonna be forced back, so. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Karis, if you can add a slide that just says now what, and then yeah. um, put that up and that people come back, um, I will tell them what just happened. We weren't done. What just happened? It oh, seems to have forced yay. us all into Welcome. out of our breakout. Yeah. It did force you. I'm so sorry. I had so a what great happened conversation was, with myself. Okay, okay, awesome. Welcome back, very, very prematurely. So what happened was is that Zoom was trying to hold us down, but we're not gonna let technology stop us. So it broke us, it broke some people out, but not other people out. And so that's okay, we're gonna use Slido. And so what is your now what? Um, what is your, uh, la what is your, what are you going to do in the next couple of days? Also, if you are someone, this is going to be an amazing moment. If you are someone who, um, so is the chat working? Okay. So if you are someone who would love to share with this group of people what you're going to do next, we have enough time for exactly two people to briefly share. And when I say briefly, I mean like, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, um, what you're going to do in the next time, and then we can unmute somebody and they can share with the whole group. So for now until November 1st, people are going to speak up instead of remaining silent. They're going to hold space and facilitate difficult conversations. Awesome. Share the info, not stay silent. My equity partner is facilitating, facilitating authentic conversations. Go social equity partner. Hold space. Why? Am I, wait, oh, why am I, I like that whole space. Why am I, aren't I talking? I, I'm going to take that. Who said that? That's taken. Wait. Um, and then be quiet and other people, when I have privilege, bring this conversation and content to my division. Um, this is awesome. Does anybody want to share their now what out loud? I see people shaking their head no, but does anybody want to shake their head yes? I see some hmms, more not sure as I'm scrolling through, more like absolutely not sharing, <laughs> more shaking your head no, this is funny. Is anybody going to shake their head yes? No? Okay. Um, Self-reflection as well as listen. I can, I can share. share. Okay, somebody's doing it. Awesome. So, okay. um, one of the thing, one of my takeaways from this is that um, I need to acknowledge that I'm very afraid of these conversations, especially being in a management role. Um, uh, there have been, I feel like people with extra sensitivities have a very large stage to make accusations when that's not what intentions were in the first place. So for me, I need to figure out how to not be afraid of this because it does scare me. Um, I don't want anybody to label me as uh, an offender when that's not my intention ever, when I am curious or I'm trying to decide 
how I can help somebody. I need to ask some uncomfortable questions. And as a manager, uh, sometimes those don't land right, uh, even when the intention is right. And, uh, and then you can get into hot water. So it's kind of <laughs> has been for the last 20 some years that I've been managing uh, easier to just not have those conversations. So this is kind of scary. That's super fair. That's why in the middle of the so cycle of socialization is fear, ignorance, confusion, and, and insecurity, and it points at all the spaces because that's true for everyone, right? So like there can be someone who is trying to interrupt the, the cycle and someone who is like, this is fine, this is how I live, and both of them are experiencing fear. And so, or both of them are experiencing ignorance at the same time. And so that's why that circles in the middle in the way that it is. Because it, it, these are the, those are the feelings that come up for people. I think that in interrupting, um, being bold and trying, but also sometimes being okay with what I call like Michael Jackson moonwalking out. Like, this is my goal as I ask you the question. And if you see it blowing up, being like, you know what, let's try this a different day or I, let's take it offline or let's figure out another place to have it. Because in this moment, the fear, ignorance, confusion, and insecurity came up and we weren't able to have a good conversation. So that is awesome. Consider it's like roller skating. I will fall. It will be hard, but I will get back up and then glide and have fun. And it'll get easier to have these conversations. That's awesome. Yeah, it is like roller skating. Um, questions, norms, and stakeholder engagement in business practices, both internal and external. Increased consciousness of gendered language use and responses. The other thing of so increased consciousness is that all of this, like especially when you're, gonna, you're not only are you going to fall, like, and it will be hard, sometimes you're just going to make mistakes. And it will, it might be hard, but it might be a softball, right? And so a tool to use in that space when someone offers a correction or offers an interruption is to say thank you, which also is personally, right? Like, so let's say I say I use somebody's wrong pronoun or I make an assumption about somebody's identity or I say something that is offensive that I didn't think it was and somebody offers like, ooh, have you thought about saying it this way? That's not how you use that. And it could be anything. Like people are like, oh, it was a crazy day. And it's like, no, I don't think you mean crazy. I think you mean wild or it was intense. Is that what you mean? Instead of going, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to think about people who had mental uh, health issues and I wasn't trying to, like, I can go into that space or I could just say thank you. And so challenging yourself to say thank you for people offering um, other ways to think about things instead of going into a sorry and I can't believe I messed up and this is the end of the world because it's not like thank you for offering that to me and I'll move forward and continue to practice that uh, before we end we only have a couple of more minutes are there any questions that I can answer uh, Nicole, you do have some questions on Slido um, I think so you can pull those okay. up um, we had about five or six questions um, the top question that came in is where does body type or weight fit in yep so body type and weight fit in as like big identity 10 right like i that um i don't think we didn't use that one but it is in no way shape or form prioritized out of this conversation body type or weight definitely is an identity a social identity that constructs have been made out of the reason that i think it often doesn't make um the big eight plus one well, we did that, right? The reason I didn't add it here is because I could add 25. But body and, and body type and weight is a huge one. In terms of like historically, it's become larger and more of a priority and the systems that have been created around it have become more impactful since probably like the early to mid 90s. And so I think that's like historically why it's not on the first one that was ever created. Um, but it definitely is a huge deal because people's body size and people's body shape is something that a lot of systems are created around. Like who can sit at the front desk because their face is not symmetrical or they don't smile a certain way or there's people who have um, maybe different looks from birth and that is not acceptable in spaces. Airplane seats, taxi cab, I mean like all of the places, seats or office chairs. There's so many things, um, and even how those are put into systems, right? So like an office chair, there's an office chair, and then there's like big and large office chairs, which is a separate category and a separate store. So it definitely fits into one of the social identities. Um, the next question, if you have um, time to answer, is what about emotional inequality? As a woman, it is exhausting to be labeled as emotional or angry or hysterical or, or, or. Yeah. So... I wouldn't, I wouldn't connect that to emotional inequality. What I would connect that is, that is the, 
how the oppression of women shows up, right? So it's not just pay gap and promotion. It's that people can't be emotional. It's that women cannot be emotional or angry or anything, right? So a really good example of that is, I don't know, and this is not a political statement. This is literally about someone being a woman, right? So there's been a lot of talk around like how Kamala Harris could show up in the debate. She can't get mad or how Hillary Clinton could show up in the debate in all the debates, right? As a woman, you can't get mad. You can't shed a tear. You can't get hysterical. But a man in those same debates and any of those days, if a man was to shed a tear, it was like, oh, my gosh, he feels the country. He should be it. Right. And that is more about being a woman than it is about emotional inequality. And so it definitely fits in there. And it is how women have been oppressed in terms of not being able to show emotion because it then means that they are incapable of doing other things or they're unstable because they're women. Oh, my time is up. Okay, so um, I'm going to get somebody asked if the Slido analytics could be shared with people who registered. I don't know the answer to that. But also, if we, um, if they send me the question, then I will answer the question, and then I can send all the questions to all the people who registered in both sessions so that I don't have to figure out who was in each session. So you'll probably get questions you didn't even see, and then I'll send them back to everybody. Does that work? Yeah, we have a record of all the questions that were asked. And just so everyone on here knows, we are going to make the slides available as well, because some of the slides have very tiny font. So just so you know, you'll be able to, to see those as well. Awesome. So analytics and questions and answers coming your way. Thank you very much for registering, for talking, for playing with our technological advances or not. I appreciate you all. And I hope mm. you have a beautiful rest of your week. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.